we'll be in Matthew chapter 25, and finishing up a rather lengthy section of Scripture that we've been in for some time now, with this glorious picture of the final judgment, a picture that strikes dread in the hearts of the wicked, but should bring rapturous joy to the hearts of God's own redeemed. Matthew 25, and I'll begin my reading this morning at verse 31. J.C. Ryle says, there are few passages in the whole Bible more solemn and heart-searching than this. It is a vision of the glorious return of Jesus, separating humanity into two irrevocable camps. There is division in our day amongst humanity over various issues. But this is a division that will take place on the last day that will be irrevocable. It's a permanent division. The camp of the blessed and the camp of the cursed. Those entering eternal bliss and those entering eternal hell. This should really provoke one question in each one of our hearts. As you listen to the preaching of God's word, you should be asking yourself, which one, which one am I? Am I among the cursed? Or am I among the blessed? Am I among the ones who will enter the eternal bliss and joy of God? Or am I among those who will enter the eternal torments of hell? Which one am I? Which one are you? Matthew 24, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, and to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Father in heaven, we invite you to fill our hearts this morning 
that your presence would come to us so that we would sense your holiness and your greatness, that we would be consumed with a vision of this day that all of creation and all of time points to. This day, when all men and women and children are gathered before this great throne of our exalted Lord, the Son of Man, in this day that will settle all days, when the righteous shall inherit eternal life and the wicked shall be cast into that lake which burns perpetually with fire. Save sinners today and strengthen your church and move with power among us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're finishing up and concluding a longer section of Scripture here that really began with the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. So this is bringing to completion about five chapters of Scripture. It's Jesus enters Jerusalem Jesus spends his time in the temple. Jesus leaves Jerusalem, and on his exit from Jerusalem, he speaks to his disciples from the Mount of Olives, where we find ourselves today. So this wraps up that section of Scripture. It's taken us a year to get through that section. I actually looked at my notes, and it was August the 8th, 2021. We were out on the field over here when we started this section. And so here we are today completing it. It ends also a smaller section that began in chapter 24, verse 1, known as the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and then prophesies his second coming. All of this is recorded in this section. An even smaller section, this wraps up today, specifically dealing with the second coming, which occurred in a series of parables. We have the parable of the thief in the night in chapter 24, the parable of the wise servant in chapter 24, the parable of the ten virgins in chapter 25, and the parable of the talents where we were last week in chapter 25. And all of this points to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and each one provokes us to ask the question, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for that day? And this section, if any of the sections, if any of those parables in this all of it discourse, if any of them provoke the question of your own readiness before God, this statement of prophecy in today's text should do it. You haven't asked that question yet. You should today. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet Jesus? The parable of the talents last week likely prompted another question in your mind. It should have. And the question that it likely prompted in your mind last week is, what type of investment is God looking for? He's talked about investing your talents wisely and how the master returns and in that parable rewards his servants on the basis of how well they invested their talents. A couple of the servants invested them quite well, then one servant just buried them and he was cast out into the other outer darkness, but the other two servants were rewarded. And so it really should, as I ask what, are you ready? I'm also asking how have you invested your spiritual resources? And you should have been asking, well, what type of investment is God looking for? And today he provides your answer as to the investment that he's looking for, at least in some respect. And here's what he's looking for. As God looks out on you, he's asking this question. Do you love his people? More specifically, do you love his people the way he wants you to love his people? That's the question. 
This, this is the measure of things. No. You're going to get into heaven on the basis of the grace of God giving you the second birth and forgiveness of sins. That's how you're going to get into heaven. It's not going to be by your works that you get into heaven. But if God's grace touches your life in a saving way, he will change your heart so that you love his people the way he wants you to. It's not salvation by works, but it is salvation by grace, and it's a grace that changes us from the inside out so that those who have saving faith, which is a gift of grace, produce the works of righteousness that verify that faith and that grace is active. It actually gives assurance. There's assurance available to those who have fruit. If you have the fruit of righteousness in your life, you should have a message of assurance today. There should be a bit of introspection that takes place. You should be asking yourself, do you have the second birth? And to those without these tokens of God's grace in your life, namely these works of righteousness that he's speaking of in this text, there should be a cry for mercy. And in fact, I think this text should prompt every single person that can hear me today to cry out to mercy, uh, cry out to God for mercy, and, and just beg God, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. These texts are to reduce us to beggars for mercy. They're to reduce us for beggars of mercy. God have mercy on me. If you leave the service today and you leave the sermon today saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. But let me just outline this quickly before I get into the body of this text. The, we're going to look at the king who separates the sheep from the goats. Then we'll see the king who rewards the sheep and then the king who damns the goats. Easy. He separates the sheep from the goats. He rewards the sheep. He damns the goats. Now, it's actually interesting as I, as I kind of reflected on this because you might have noticed that in our day and age, people mock sheep. They call people sheeple. But really, if you're a sheep and you're trusting of God, that's a good thing. And then people who excel in various fields, they call them the goat, which is kind of interesting. If somebody's very good, they say, well, that's the goat. Well, that seems to be the inverse of what Scripture is telling us. Because Scripture is telling us that the goats go to hell and the sheep go to heaven. So just keep that in your mind. But regardless of that, it's not a major issue, but it's just something I thought I would point out. The Bible tells us that at the last day, the Lord Jesus will arrive and this King, Jesus Christ, will separate the sheep from the goats. Verse 31 through 33, a vision of the final judgment, the glorious return of Christ, and the final separation. Verse 31, it tells us that the Son of Man will arrive. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is the exalted Christ of Matthew chap or sorry of Daniel chapter 7 he arrives in glory and he arrives for judgment it tells us he comes in his glory okay and all the angels with him he has this glorious entourage then he will sit on his glorious throne you have this picture and if any picture in the bible should prompt you to worship god in christ it's this picture Picture it, won't you? You have Christ descending from the heavens. The scriptures tell us his eyes are like fire. And he's shining as bright as the sun as he returns bodily, eyes piercing. His body is as shining as the sun. And not only is he shining as the sun, but he's surrounded by an entourage of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of glorious angels, angelic beings, that they themselves radiate glory. And so picture this, if you will, the Lord Jesus descending from the heavens, as I have just described him, and he's coming to earth and the whole world is beholding him. He's surrounded by the angels. The angels are standing there and they're watching him. And what does he do? He sits down while all are standing. And he is the one that takes a seat. There is a splendor. There's a brightness. There's a brilliance. There's a radiance that is all compounded. 
As one commentator noted, there is a picture in the Bible that should prompt you to worship him. It's that. But it goes on. The description is in more detail. You have the Son of Man glowing like the sun with eyes of piercing fire, surrounded by thousands upon thousands of radiant angels, and he sits down in the middle of them as they stand there watching. And then the next step unfolds in verse 32, where he gathers the nations in front of him. Before him will be gathered all the nations. This is the greatest gathering that you could imagine. This is, this is 10,000 packed football stadiums. And then some. Gathered to behold this glorious Christ. And all of them are standing in silence as he sits. And all of a sudden it dawns upon humanity. It's true. It's true. Here he is. Here's the day of reckoning. It's happened. The last call has already gone out. The last call to repentance has occurred. And now... Having given the last call of repentance before his arrival, he arrives. There is no call to repentance. And now justice will be meted out and the wicked will be cast into hell and the righteous will be going to heaven or living in heaven on earth forever and ever. And by the way, the last time the nations had the opportunity to publicly behold Jesus Christ, it was a very different picture. The last time the nations had the opportunity to publicly behold Jesus Christ. He was humiliated and crucified by the nations on the cross, Jew and Gentile alike, at the hands of the Romans, fulfilling the desire of the Jews. And there he was. He was shamed and he was crucified. And they mocked and they scorned him and they spat upon him. But now, here he comes again for this next public display. And this is a glorious public display. Indeed, he arrives surrounded by angels. He sits down, and then he beckons in an irresistible call for all of the nations to come and stand in front of him. As John Broadus said, the judge wants a homeless wanderer now enthroned in glory, wants despised and rejected, now accepting or rejecting, wants subjected to unrighteous judgment, now judging the world in righteousness, and he will separate. Verse 32 through 33, it says, And he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the goats from the sheep, or the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. This is built on the reference to the shepherd who def divides in Ezekiel 34, verse 17. And it was common, apparently, for Eastern, Middle Eastern shepherds to mix the goats and the sheep. As they graze during the day and then to divide them in the evening. From a distance, they look somewhat similar. But up close, the shepherd can tell the difference. And from a distance, all human beings look the same. As Jesus looks out from the, nation, or from the heavens and he looks out at the nations, he can see the distinction, though. There is a sheep and there is a goat. You might look out and they all might look the same. I might look out from this pulpit here and I might see hundreds of you sitting there and I say, well, they all look the same. It's all just people. But Jesus has the ability, his eyes pierce through it all and his eyes cut through all of the pretense and he's able to see from heaven, even as he will be able to declare on that day, that is a sheep and that is a goat. And he knows. Are you ready for this division? The right hand is the place and position of honor. And so the sheep are initially marked off for honor because they're placed on his right. And on the left is the opposite. It is a place of contempt. And we see very quickly a glorious judgment scene. And the judgment begins to be meted out. But the first act at this scene of judgment, having seated on his throne, sitting on his ju judicial bench... With the thousands of angels surrounding him and then gathering football stadium after football stadium after football stadium to sit in front of him. 
His first act is to divide. Cut humanity in half. The sheep on the right and the goats on the left. The next step is he rewards the sheep. This is what happens next. This is his first declaration of judgment is the, the commendation towards the sheep. Son of man, in verse 34, it says, then the king will say, he's now referred to as the king, by the way. You might have noted the sermon series through Matthew, as long as it's been, is called The King Has Arrived. He's referred to as the son of David in chapter 1, verse 6 of Matthew. He's referred to as king of the Jews by the wise men in chapter 2, verse 2. Matthew calls him king with an Old Testament quote in Matthew 21, verse 5. He's insinuated to be the king in the parable of the wedding feast, but this is the first time in all of the gospel of Matthew that Jesus has referred to himself as king. Up until now, he has not said he's the king. Matthew's told us, other people have told us, some have pointed it out to us, but this is the first time that it is self-declared that he is the king. And this is how the way God works. God works by slowly declaring himself over time, slowly revealing himself over time, so that as time goes on, you receive more information, and this is how it has worked in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, he speaks to the sheep, this king, Speaks to the sheep in verse 34. The, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So picture this, if you will. The scene's getting more glorious, isn't it? The son, is, the son of man is seated on his throne. His eyes are fire. His, his body is glowing like the sun. The thousands of angels while he's seated are standing to attend to him. The throng of humanity is before him. He's now divided humanity in half. You could picture that sea of humanity dividing in half as Moses would have divided the Red Sea. Right there they part. Right and left, sheep and goat, righteous and wicked. And then he points to the sheep and he says, I will give you my kingdom. This is my kingdom that has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Notice this kingdom. It's been prepared since the foundation of the world, there's effort, there's thought, there's work. Meticulous amount of thoughtful detail has gone into the preparation of this kingdom. The curtain is drawn back and they get to look at the kingdom. They get a glimpse of it. Imagine a kingdom, the steeples, the spires, the palaces, standing tall over the streets of gold. Reflecting in all of their glory across this crystal sea. Decorated with lush gardens and the brightest of flowers. All of the variety organized in such a way. So detailed that it's something the king has been wanting to give them from the foundation of the world. The effort, the work, the thoughtfulness that has gone into this. He himself, what does he say? He has prepared it for you. For you. And then we have this. Glowing with his presence, what does he do? Indicating that he's prepared this for them, the thoughtfulness, this glimpse at this glorious kingdom with the sun reflecting off of the steeples and the spires and the palaces and the streets of gold and the crystal sea. And the son of God, the king himself says, come. Wow, what an invitation, come. Come and receive your gift. The meek of the earth who have suffered at the hands of the wicked and who have been scoffed at and laughed at and deprived of vindication until this day. Come. Come and receive your reward. What a reward it is. What a reward it is. The king tells them, having given them the kingdom, what has marked them off is heirs of such a prize. He tells them, how is it that they have been branded? How did he brand them? How have they been marked off as his own? Well, they loved him tangibly. In verse 35 through 36, it tells us that's, that was the branding of the sheep. 
The shepherd branded the sheep. He marked the sheep off by branding them with a love of Christ that manifests itself in a very tangible way. Verse 35 says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You see that? They saw that he was in need and they cared for him. The sheep, however, revealing their meekness and humility, are actually a little shocked. They're surprised that he's speaking so well of them. In verse 37, they kind of retort back. They don't retort back saying, of course, Lord, we've earned it. They say, what? We did that? This is the meekness of the sheep coming through. The sheep are not boastful. The sheep give and they don't even realize they're giving. It's just their nature to give. And in verse 37, it says, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, we did, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? It's this, this question. They're such unpretentious. These sheep are. And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? So unpretentious are they. This conversation between the king and the sheep is humanity has been divided. And he's sitting upon his throne with the thousands of angels around him. The football stadiums of people in front of him. Humanity divided. Marks off his sheep. Unveils with the curtain the kingdom of God. And says, there it is, it's yours. And then he tells them how he's marked them off. They're such benevolent people towards his very own people. They've displayed a love for his people. And they just kind of retort back in awe. Really? We did that? We didn't even know we did that. The sheep of God are not boastful, are they? This is so counterintuitive to our own day and age when people love to boast and inflate themselves. Everyone's their own superstar online. But the king answers them in verse 40. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Did you see that? He recognizes them by how they cared for him, and he recognizes, he recognizes their care of him for how they cared for his people. Do you notice the little word? My brothers. The least of these, my brothers. This isn't a general benevolence toward humanity. This is a specific benevolence to, towards those who are indwelt by the Spirit of God. He recognizes the love of his own people by their love of his people. This refers to all of Christ's poor. And our thoughts are probably and likely should be, especially with the mention of prison in here, his persecuted poor. Especially the persecuted poor. But all of Christ's poor. But especially the persecuted poor. All of Christ's people. This is not a reference generally to humanity. This is a reference specifically to his people, his brothers. He so identifies with his people. And this has come up, by the way, before Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. He so identifies with his people that when we treat his people a certain way, he recognizes that is how we treat him. And then he distinguishes between these two types of humanity on the basis of how we treated his people in the day of judgment. Isn't that something? Now, having gone through our own persecution, not as strong as some have gone through it in times past in other parts of the world, but nonetheless having experienced it, you can understand the, the stigma that comes by associating with the persecuted. Oh, you really want to give food to those people? Oh, you really want to be around those people? Do you really want to identify with, with them? I mean, you know what they believe. You know what they do. You know what people say about them. 
Do you really want to be among those people who actually give food and help and benevolence and visit them when they're in prison? I mean, goodness gracious, they're in prison for a reason. They broke the law, don't you know? I think the insinuation here is that they're in prison because they're being persecuted for being in prison. Or they're being persecuted, and the consequence of their persecution, of their obedience to Jesus Christ, is they're in prison. Yes, they broke the law, but the laws were unjust, so they ended up in prison. This passage, by the way, I should just let you know personally. This passage, personally, on a very personal level, it was one of the very first passages that came to my mind when James Coates was arrested. And Tim Stevens, by the way. And I saw so many Christians, so-called, and so many pastors slandering those two men on the Internet. And I thought about this passage, and I hope you did too. I wanted to identify with them. Because this is, these are the people that the Lord identifies with. The, the people that are persecuted for righteousness. Your love for God's people, especially God's people, when they suffer, is God's branding of you. It's a branding of God. A, a cattle farmer will brand his cattle with a mark that he will burn into their flesh or tattoo on them. And God has branded you with the mark of the love of God's people if you are truly among his converts. He will mark you off and he says, that's how I know he is mine. That's how I know that she is mine. She or she loves my people and cares for my people and shows kindness to my people even when the world won't. And the world hates them and locks them up and throws them in prison. The point is that Christ so identifies with his people that the ones who are willing to bear his reproach with them are the ones that he will identify with on Judgment Day. I, I just got to ask you before I move on to this next section as I talk about the goats. Finishing up on the sheep. Will you join God's people in, re, in bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ? Will you join God's people in bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ? And bearing the shame that comes by identifying with the crucified Savior and the people that live for Him and Him alone. Won't you join that? Won't you become a Christian today? Stand up and say, I am saved. I want to be born again. I want to have Jesus Christ. I want to have His eternal reward. And I will count all of the material blessings of this world with contempt if it means I receive the kingdom of heaven. Won't you become a Christian today? This is a call, by the way, to care for not only the persecuted, but the true poor and sick among us. And some of you do that. Many of you do that on a regular basis. Your lives are preoccupied with caring for the sick or caring for those who are hurting. Some of you have sick family members or sick children or sick parents, and they need you on a regular basis, and you are exhausted and you're caring for them. It is exhausting, but by the way, this is evidence of your genuine conversion before Jesus Christ because this is how he will mark you off on judgment day. When you are looking into the eyes or you are caring for that sick person or that poor person or that persecuted person and you're willing to identify with them, the Lord is looking down on you and he's saying, that person is identifying with me. I will identify with that person. This is the love of God. This takes place week in, week out, in a thousand different ways in a truly converted church that nobody sees but the Lord. Some of you, you, you continue on and you care for people and you love people and you serve people and you say, nobody sees it, the Lord sees it. And the Lord cares. And He identifies with that. And he looks down from heaven and he says, that is one of my branded sheep. Not a goat, but a sheep. It's evidence of genuine conversion and future glory. And they receive their reward. 
this glorious kingdom, spires and steeples and palaces and streets of gold and crystal sea, and most importantly, gilded with the glory of Christ. He in the middle of it. And his people living in love and joy for all eternity. He rewards the sheep. But finally, he damns the goats. He damns the goats. Having spoken to the sheep on the right, he addresses the goats on his left. Verse 41 then he will say to those on his left, apart from me, you curse it into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I hope you notice the distinction between this pronouncement and the pronouncement to the sheep. To the sheep, he says, come. To the goats, he says, depart. The sheep come into his glorious presence. The goats are commanded out of his presence. To the sheep, in verse 34, he says, bless it. To the goats, he says, curse it. The sheep receive the eternal blessing of God, but the goats receive the eternal curse of God. The sheep re pre receive a place prepared for you. The goats receive a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you see the distinction? The goats go to hell. And the sheep go to heaven. But, but by the way, I'm going to look at why the goats go to hell and why Jesus damns them. And I want you to note, the goats go to hell not for what they do, but for what they don't do. Now, now, there's plenty of places in the Bible that tells us that people will go to hell for what, they don't, for what they do. You'll go to hell. Adulterers go to hell, and thieves go to hell, and liars go to hell. That's all over the Bible. But in this text, it doesn't mention any of that. It doesn't mention the bad things they do. It mentions the good things they don't do. I hope that, I hope you understand that, because that's important. Here, he damns them for the good things they don't do, not the bad things they do do. Verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Did you see that? It's not enough for us to not do evil. That's not the only thing that marks a Christian off. The Christian isn't known just for not doing evil. The Christian is known for what? For doing good. I think there's too many people that come to church and they, they embrace the principles of Christianity because they want to embrace wholesome principles or conservative principles. And they say, I'm tired of the, the, the putrefication of the world and so I want to be around Christians because these are wholesome people and so they say, I'm just not going to do evil. But Jesus says, that's not the only thing that marks off a Christian. A Christian is marked off not just by a repulsion of evil, but by actually putting in an effort to do good. And these people go to hell because they didn't do good. They didn't actually do acts of good. And by the way, I, I just tell you pastorally, my observation is that the absence of doing good typically leads to the presence of doing evil. The absence of good works creates energy for bad works. I've, I've seen this so many times. Specifically with people that are dealing with sexual immorality. And people that are doing with sexual immorality, they got all this energy that they're putting into sexual immorality, whether it's porn or adultery or homosexuality, and all of this energy is going into that. Why is their energy going into that? Because they're not putting energy into good. Their eyes are on themselves. And a sure tell tale of, or a sure tell sign of conversion is that the eyes are no longer on yourself, but they're on God. But if they go to hell for not doing good, by the way, how much more will people go to hell for actively doing bad? And if these people go to hell for not doing good to God's people, how much more will those go to hell who do bad to God's people? Note their pride in verse 44. It says, then they also will answer saying... 
Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Notice their pretension, their pride. While the righteous weren't even aware of their good works, their humility, the wicked aren't even aware of their absence of good works, their pride. The righteous are busy doing good works because it's just how the Lord's made them up and they're just doing it. They don't even realize they're doing it. And the wicked, they, they come to judgment day and they say, what, I didn't do any good works? Are you kidding me? That this is a word to the self-righteous, the self-assured. The person who loves to pat himself on the back for his own good works, this is a word to you. Be careful, because the people that stand before God on judgment day that he damns, the goats, will be convinced that they've done enough good works to get into heaven, but they'll go straight to hell. This is, this is humbling stuff, full of pride and pretense. And then comes the judgment, verse 45. John Gill comments on it, going into verse 45. I say, with a stern countenance and great resentment is one highly offended and with the glory of a, of a judge or the authority of a judge. Jesus says in verse 45, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. He rebukes them. They had no regard for his suffering people. He has no regard for them. None. He said, where were you when my people were being persecuted? Where were you when my people were in need? Where were you when my people were hungry? Where were you when my people needed the essence of life, food and nourishment and clothing and hospitality? Where were you? And by the way, some of you might need to reflect and some of the Christians within our community might need to reflect on the last two or three years. And if you stand before Christ on judgment day and he says, you didn't visit me when, I, when you were lonely and you didn't welcome the lonely, it won't work if you stand up and say, well, the government told me not to. Where were you when society was most lonely? Were you helping people? Or were you just following orders? The goats go to hell and the sheep go to heaven. Both are forever, by the way. Look at what it says in verse 46. This is the final pronouncement. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Did you see that word eternal before each of them, modifying, modifying each noun there? Eternal punishment and eternal life. Did you see that little modification, that little adjective before each one? You know what that tells me? It tells me that people in hell will be in hell just as long as people are in heaven. That surely as heaven is forever, so as hell is forever. That's what it tells me. The punishment of goats lasts just as long as the life of sheep. Both are forever and both are eternal. And the sentence is pronounced and that is it. There's no going back. Forever. It's a long word, forever. It's a long word. 10,000 years forever has just begun. 10 billion years forever has just begun. 100 billion years and forever has just begun. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It never ends. You'd be in heaven enjoying the glory of Jesus Christ for 10 billion times 10 billion years and it will have just begun. And you will be in hell with the boils of your skin rotting away in the fires of hell for 10 billion times 10 billion times 10 billion years. And it will have just begun. The microwave oven of hell is forever. And the glory of heaven is forever. The king separates the goats from the sheep. He rewards the sheep and he damns the goats. I just want to ask you a question. Are you a sheep or are you a goat? Are you one of Christ's or not? Are you ready to meet your maker on that day or not? If you do anything with this life of yours, ensure that you're ready for that day. Are you ready? For those who suffer, for those who are lonely, etc., people you love, have turned on you. I want you to know that in your suffering, in your loneliness, in your persecution, in all of it, a family has abandoned you, a friends have abandoned you. I want you to know that Jesus Christ identifies with his people. He loves his people. 
He himself suffered alone, and he himself identifies with his disciples who suffer alone. So much does he identify with those who suffer alone. So much does he identify with the lonely that in this text he counts them as his very own, identifying with them and their sufferings. Every time you suffer, if you feel you're suffering alone or not, understand this, that Jesus identifies, if you're in Christ, he identifies with your sufferings. He looks at you and he's right there suffering with you, identifying with them. And by the way, the Gospel of Matthew records at least two great judgment scenes. The first is in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And there, what he does is he sends people to hell who claim to have done spectacular things for him. They've done miracles, they've prophesied, etc. Here, he sends people to hell who have done absolutely nothing for him, and he sends people to heaven who, does, who have done basically unnoticeable things for him. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me that this modern evangelical idea that if you're going to do great things for God, it's going to be big and spectacular, and everyone is going to notice is somewhat bunk. The most glorious things that you can do for the Lord Jesus Christ are quite often done in the quiet place where nobody sees but him. And you sit back, and you might have heard last Sunday's sermon, and you might have slunk down in your seat, and you say, I've never done anything spectacular for Jesus Christ that anybody's really paid any attention to. That's not what he's talking about in this text. He's talking about who are you when nobody's looking because he's looking. And he sees those little, otherwise, in the eyes of the world, insignificant, little, quiet deeds that you do in the quietness, and he is able to mark you off and brand you off as one of his own by how you quietly treat people that really can't do you any good, but how you quietly treat people who he identifies with. That is the mark of a disciple. Often the greatest things you can do for the king are the things that nobody else sees but the king. That's where the heart is tested. And if Jesus sends people to hell for not doing good for his people, how much more he will punish those who do evil for his people? Some, many of you, do good for those in need. You give to the benevolence in the church. You visit the lonely and sick. You give voice for the voiceless. You endure great hardship for your suffering family, relatives, or children, or otherwise. And Jesus sees it all, and he smiles approvingly. He's glad for it. He's thankful for it. He's thankful to see the fruits of the second birth in your life. But i got to ask you what this text, I think, is asking you. Are you born again? Are you ready? Are you ready? The second birth is not just abandoning the unwholesome behavior of this world. It is the miraculous heart change that gives not only the repulsion of evil, but it gives the desire for good. It gives the desire to do unrecognized deeds, deeds that are unrecognized by this world, but that the Savior looks down from heaven and he smiles upon. That's what the second birth produces. And a church of born-again people is a church that quietly cares for each other simply because that's what their hearts want to do. They don't even need to be told in a sermon because they're already doing it. And So I'll ask you what I've been asking you for these last many weeks here. As I state the fact that the Lord is going to return, He's going to sit, He's going to divide all of humanity into two groups of people, the sheep and the goat, and the angels are going to be surrounding him, and he's going to reward the sheep, and he's going to throw the goats into hell. I just have to ask you this one more time before we close off this section of Scripture. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day? Are you ready?